Classes in Polymer Dynamic, based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Chapter 6, Segmental Motion. Today we're going to discuss Chapter 6 on Segmental Diffusion. And I, actually, there are a fair number of things in Chapter 6 beyond simply moving segments that we're going to spend some time talking about. For next time, read reference 14 in Chapter 6. And we'll discuss it as an example of the sort of work that can be done. So where we are, where we are going to be, is we're going to start out actually discussing moving polymers doing thermal as opposed to driven motion. So first we're going to consider what we can say about polymer motion. And there is a traditional uh, division of polymer motion into parts. The division lies in the sense, and we, things occur on different time scales. But let me draw a sketch. And the sketch shows a polymer molecule. So here is a polymer molecule. And I'm not showing the molecular detail of the main chain. And then off to the side, we have a side chain. And if, for example, we have polystyrene, there's a benzene ring sitting there. Now, it's actually attached to organic compounds over here, but I haven't drawn them. And what we now ask is how this molecule can move. And the first answer is, this is a benzene ring. This is a single bond. So we have free rotation like this. Now, it's not completely free rotation. That is, there's a potential energy between the benzene ring and the backbone. And so, to some extent, some orientations are preferred to others. Uh, the extent may not be very strong, but you shouldn't think that there's no interaction at all. And we can, and therefore, if we are clever, we can actually measure the benzene ring rotating around this bond. And this happens on very short time scales. What do I mean by very small? Well, picoseconds is always nice, though there might be other answers. But the main issue is this, is this is the fastest sort of process you can get. Now, you might ask, can you get similar processes in the main chain? And the answer is, in general, not very easily because of the structure of organic structure. But here we get something very fast. Uh, in terms of Stockmayer was a polymer physicist, chemist, of oh, half century ago, though he was around much more recently. And this discussion originally refers to dielectric relaxation, which is the next chapter. And this is what is called type C relaxation. The next relaxation, which is also quite fast, but not as fast as this, involves the notion that we can get rotation this way, where the chain does a motion that's a little hard to do with your hands. Uh, it does the sort of rotation that you encounter in an automobile crankshaft, where there is a piece of the car, and it is a complicated shape, and it rotates like my hands are rotating. Uh, and the point of the crankshaft rotation, let me draw a section of organic structure. This is a bit, oh, this is a bit stretched, but I will draw the structure. So here is a line of carbon atoms. Okay. 
Now, this bond and that bond have been drawn to be lined up, which is very simple. And if they're lined up, which is a little optimistic if you think this happens very often, you could get rotation around here and around there, and these groups swing around like that. Now, in order for this to happen, these two bonds have to be parallel to each other. If they're parallel, this works. If they're not parallel, things do not work. Um, these are all single bonds. There's not free rotation around here. It's restricted in the sense that there are conformations that are more favorable and less favorable. But there is no particular reason for this bond to be in the plane of the blackboard and not out here someplace pointing towards you. So far, so good? Well, as a result, this sort of rotation gets quite complicated. And in order to make it work, you actually have to have things pulling and pushing at greater distances. Nonetheless, you can get rotation like this. Stockmayer type B, and the molecule will change bunches of bond angles at the same time to accommodate. And the benzene ring, if you imagine my thumb is the bond out to the benzene ring, is doing something like this. Um, let me emphasize, I've been saying rotation. And the simplest thing, if you think of rotation, is, for example, a top, a child's toy. It spins on its point. Or the hand on the clock is rotation. Real molecular rotation, because there are other molecules in the way, is more complicated than that. And you may get displacement through an angle over some time. And then there are changes in speed, and maybe even changes in direction. So if you ask, how do molecules reorient, just saying things rotate as if they were spinning freely is not necessarily completely accurate. And in fact, the motion on a long time scale is somewhat diffu like diffusion. However, the core issue is the direction changes. And after a while, if you're patient, the direction the molecule is pointing is unrelated to the direction in which it started. Now we come to the third sort of rotation, which is we have a bond direction here from one carbon to the next. And we could get rotation around this axis. Um, rotation around the axis pointing this way out of plane like this is Stockmayer type B. But we could also get rotation in which at one time the bond is pointing this way, and at a later time the bond is pointing some other way. How could you possibly get such a motion? Well, the simplest, here's a polymer molecule. Imagine it's as rigid as a bent up piece of coat hanger, rigid wire. The whole molecule could rotate like that. And if the whole molecule rotates, it's not going to spin freely, but it will change which way it's pointing. When the whole molecule rotates, it carries along each of the little pieces. However, there will also be a part, I'm going to have to erase the board. Here is a molecule at one moment in time. And here is a little piece of the molecule. Yes? Molecules are, polymer molecules, most of them are rather flexible. Now, there are a few molecules that are not flexible. Rod polymers that are somewhat stiff up to totally stiff. Um, you can get molecules that are quite totally stiff. 
DNAs are stiff over fairly long distances because of their complicated organic structure. And the net result of saying the molecule is floppy is that if it was like this at one time, at some later time, it will be, for example, like that. And as the molecule wiggles, this vector, this section of the molecule, is now facing that way. It's changed the direction it's facing because the molecule flops. And the molecule is not rigid. So the molecules have internal motions. So they're mo internal motions of molecules. And if we have this big chain and we wait a while, at some third time, it will be like this. Now I'm going to draw an arrow. The arrow I just drew is the end to end vector. It's a vector that starts at one end of the molecule and goes to the other. And that vector, in some sense, tells you the direction, the orientation of the molecule. Now, when we went from our first confirmation, that was this one, to our second confirmation, this molecule changed which way it was pointing, but the end-to-end -end vector happened to be the same. But now we go on to this third confirmation, in which this vector is now pointing this way, and at the same time, the end-to-end -end vector of the molecule has now also changed direction and length. And so the end-to-end -end vector, which says something about which way the molecule is pointing, can change its orientation It can change its length. When you change the end-to-end -end vector orientation, which way the end-to-end -end vector points, you are doing rotation. And if you are just changing the length of the vector so it gets longer and shorter, that is what is called a breathing, you know, like inhaling, exhaling mode. So, useful minor detail though. Suppose I go along the polymer molecule and break it into segments. Each of those segments, because it's a chunk of the molecule, is free to change which way it points. And it can do that through internal motions. However, there's a constraint. If I add up over all of these little pieces which way each one points, I have to start here and I have to end up there. And therefore, the total of all of the little pieces is constrained because it has to add up to the end-to-end -end vector. In order to change which way the end-to-end -end vector points, I have to wait for the whole molecule to change direction, to rotate. Now, the whole molecule is in a liquid. It does not rotate freely like um, a planet around the sun. It does diffusion. It changes shape. However, the, the mode of motion that changes us from here to there is fairly slow. The sum of all of these little pieces, therefore, has a part, not the whole thing, but it has a part, a little bit, which must add up to this. And therefore, each of these little pieces has a part of its direction, which it can only change when the whole molecule changes direction. 
And therefore, when we talk about motion, di direction of pointing along the molecule, there will be a fast piece because the molecule can wiggle. There will be a fast term. But part of the direction that the molecule points is going to be relaxed only because the molecule rotates. This is Stockmeyer type A. So, that, so we have now said we have a polymer molecule and it's floppy. If you imagine a, an over, a very long overboiled noodle in a big pot of water, and the pot is being not boiling, so you tear the noodle, but the water is roiling, and the noodle is carried around. The noodle changes shape. If you look at the two ends and what which direction it is from one end to the other, it keeps changing, and that is the sort of motion a polymer can perform. I am slightly oversimplifying in one respect, namely I'm saying the molecule changes shape, but it's not, for most of what we'll be talking about, driven motion where you apply a shear or whatever. Instead, it's simply a matter that the, uh, there are, the molecule is not at absolute zero, the atoms move back and forth at random, and this gives us a diffusion process. Okay, so I have now talked about modes of molecular motion, and I have talked about Stockmeyer type A, type B, and type C motions. From the standpoint of this course, where we're interested in how polymer, molecule, polymer solutions for example, flow due to viscosity. The type C motions, where the, say, the benzene ring is just spinning around its bond, attaching it to the backbone, the type C motions are not very important because they happen on a very fast time scale. The type B motions are not so important and the major issues, how does the whole chain move, are in large part described by the type A motions. Okay, so we have now discussed molecular motions. Now, if we're actually interested in studying this, if we are interested in studying this, we have experimental methods which actually give us information about the background, about what is happening in solution. And the ex what the experimental methods do is to tell us how rapidly the molecule is reorienting. So what are the major methods we're going to talk about? And the major methods we're going to talk about are VH scattering and time resolved polarization and NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, each of these gives different information because the physical process that leads to something happening is different for the three sorts of motion. Um, NMR gives us information on a very local distance scale. That is, we have, for example, There's a little chunk of a molecule. And since there is a piece of molecule here, there's a chemical bond there which has a direction. And what NMR is directly sensitive to is the orientation, the direction in space of that bond 
with respect to the local magnetic field. Now, NMR has the limitation relative to the speed on which things ha happen that NMR frequencies are quite low. They are, well, when I was an undergraduate, it was tens of megahertz. And when I was first a, grad, a, a faculty member, we were talking hum, a few hundred megahertz. And people are now creeping up on a gigahertz. However, the time scale, oh yes, useful issue. There is a frequency, nu, so many cycles per second, hertz. There is a time, tau, which is a time scale for the motion. And these are inversely related. So if I say I am looking at something in a frequency range of one gigahertz, that's approximately like saying I am looking on a time scale of a nanosecond. That, that relationship is slightly imprecise because time domain and frequency domain are not the same thing. However, what we can get out of NMR, and I discuss this in more detail in the book and give you some references, um, if you're really interested in NMR, there is a very nice web page from a fellow at it's one of the universities in Rochester, which really explains very clearly how all these things work. Um, I'll get the ref try to get the reference for next time. Um, in any event, didn't think to bring it. In any event, the core issue is what you can do with NMR is to pull out a characteristic time tau, which is how long the molecule, the bond, remembers it's pointing in its original direction. Now, that the statement that there is a time is imprecise. First of all, it's not that all of these bonds sit there and that much time later they all flip 90 degrees. The motions are diffusive, like my, the way I'm pointing my finger. And furthermore, at some, as time goes on, the molecule is less and less likely to be pointed in its original direction. And if you wait long enough, like picoseconds or nanoseconds, the direction the bond is pointed has nothing to do with the direction in which it started. The, there, the, the system has a memory, and the, the molecular bond, so to speak, forgets which way it was originally pointed. And what you can extract out is a relaxation time for a single bond. Um, so that's bond reorientation. The next thing one can do is to talk about time-resolved polarization. Now, the first point I should emphasize is that for many chains, when you're doing time-resolved polarization measurements, you have produced a polymer that is specific for the experiment in which you have inserted a chemical group into the center. And the chemical group is called a chromophore. What does this, what sort of experiment are we doing? Okay. We send in a pulse of light. And so the light is bright, but it is bright for a very short period of time, like a picosecond. You can do this with a pulse laser. There are alternative methods. The light comes in, and it finds the chromophore. I'm being imprecise as to what is there in the molecule. And it excites a dipole a transition dipole in the molecule. And it takes this molecule and it moves it to an excited electronic state. So in a, the molecule, or the little piece of the molecule, it actually is the little piece of the molecule, is sitting there, has absorbed light of this frequency. And now what happens? Well, if you wait a little while, you get fluorescence. The molecule absorbed light, and if you wait a bit, 
the light comes out again. It's like one of these things that glows in the dark if you leave it in sunlight for a while. This is fluorescence. However, there's some features of fluorescence which are a little more elaborate than just it glows in the dark. We send in light that has a polarization, which we usually call vertical, by which we mean we have a table on which the apparatus is sitting, we have a light source, we have a sample, we have a detector, the camera, and the vertical axis is perpendicular to the plane of the table and perpendicular to the plane of the incident light and the outbound light. The outbound light, well, it's a mixture of vertically polarized light and horizontally polarized light. Why is that the case? Well, the molecular process is we're sending in vertically polarized light. It's absorbed by the material. And we excite a, what is called a transition dipole in the material. However, the transition dipole in the material has to lie in a direction fixed by the organic structure of the material. So in general, it will lie at some direction like this, which is not the same as the direction of the incident light. Then, when this light is re-emitted by the dipole, the scattered light will come out, typically, with a polarization, which I'm indicating here, like this. And so if I sit off at the camera and measure, measure the intensity of polarized light that way or that way, well, the polarization of emission is like this. So if I put my Polaroid filter, or more elaborate device actually, this way or that way, I measure a certain amount of intensity in each direction. So far, so good? Now we come to the complicated part. This dipole is attached to the molecule. I'll show you how in a bit. As the molecule reorients, the Stockmeyer A, B, and C processes come in and change the direction of this dipole. Actually, it's only the A process, and I'll show you how that's done in a few moments. Um, the important issue is, though, if I fire this in, it's a picosecond pulse, and I ask, what is the direction of the light polarization right after I sent the pulse in? Well, it's basically like this. However, if I sit and wait as time goes on, and do I wait very long? No, I wait picoseconds, this, or nanoseconds. I wait the time scale on which the molecule reorients. Initially, this dipole, this typical dipole, was facing one way. But as time goes on, the direction of the dipole changes. The dipole forgets which way it was pointing originally. And in the end, the light that reaches the camera has no net polarization. That is, this fluorescent molecule emits a a photon, but the photon eventually is equally likely to be polarized one way or the other. And there is a time scale on which the um, emitted light starts being out being polarized, and if you sit and wait, the molecule forgets which way it's pointing. And you can actually measure the reorientation that is, if you say this is a vector, let's call it D. We have a vector which had some direction at time 0, and I'll take the dot product. It has some direction at time T. And if we average, what we discover is that at time, if T is 0, the dipole always points along its original direction. It hasn't had time to move. But as time goes on, if I measure what happens, there is an orientation function which decays in time. So this function 
decays as time goes on and the molecule forgets about which way it's pointing. So far so good? So that is time resolved polarization. Um, it gives information about an organic group, not, a sing not just a single bond. So it is giving information about slightly larger extent. There's another feature. I am not going to draw organic molecules. You don't have to worry about that. However, here is a piece of a backbone chain. That's not, of course, all polymers don't have carbon, carbon, carbon as their backbone, but it's a hypothetical example. And what I do is I stick in here the chromophore. Because most polymer molecules don't really have chromophores. They don't have something that does a nice job of absorbing light and re-emitting. So we take an organic group, which is something <coughs> like anthracene, it's, uh, which is coupled benzene rings. And we stick the organic group in here. And we choose our organic group so that the um, transition dipole points like that. And that's a matter of doing organic chemistry. That is, you have, if I put in here an organic molecule, I can find organic molecules which will couple to the two bonds, as indicated, and their transition dipole will lie like this. But I can also find some where the transition dipole points this way. And it's simply a matter of doing good organic chemistry and getting the right organic subunit here. Now, in order to do this, I actually have to do organic synthesis. That is, I have to find an appropriate chromophore. I have to then identify the polymers I want here and here. And then I have to do chemical synthesis to stick this thing in where I want it. Most of the results that you will see in the book refer to the situation in which I took this thing and stuck it in right dead center in the molecule. So this and this chain are exactly the same length. However, there are a few experiments in which here is the molecule and we will stick this group onto one end. So we can look at how the end moves as opposed to the center. Because the dipole lies this way, and it really does lie like this, the only way the uh, direction of the dipole can be relaxed is a Stockmeyer type A motion. Uh, that is, the whole chain has to rotate end over end, or at least this local piece has to be rotated end over end. Uh, anything that does a crankshaft-like motion that we are not sensitive to. Let me draw a little contrast here. You remember I said that NMR was sensitive in the example I gave to CH bond directions. CH bond points that way. The CH bond direction is substantially rotated by crankshaft motions, type B motions. It's not ro ro relaxed at all, in this case, by a type A motion because there's nothing to rotate around the axis I'm now showing. Of course, you could say, I will stick some organic thing out here and have a proton here. And then, if we flip the molecule like this, the direction of this CH bond axis can be relaxed. And since NMR is very sensitive and tunable, you could actually watch separately the relaxation of each of the bond directions. However, in this case, we have synthesized something in which the uh, molecule excitation dipole lies along here. And therefore, if the molecule never changed direction, we'd never see any relaxation that is the polarization of the emitted light would never change because the molecule can rotate and change shape. What we find is that the direction of the bond axis 
changes as time goes on, and therefore the amount of depolarization changes. Okay, that's um, time resolves polarization. If you think about it, you realize there is a limitation on this technique. And the limitation on this technique is, this is a fluorescent molecule. You've pumped light into it. And as time goes on, because of quantum mechanical processes, the light is re-emitted. This molecule has a lifetime on which it stores energy. As time goes on, when you go beyond that lifetime, there's an, as you go beyond it, there's an exponential decay of how, many photon, how much energy is stored. And if you go way beyond the lifetime, all of the fluorescent molecules have re-emitted, and there's no more light coming out at you. And therefore, there is a time limit uh, for actually seeing the reorientation with this method. And the time limit is that the organic molecule has to have a sufficiently long lifetime. Um, of course, some organic molecules are very cooperative in this respect and have long lifetimes. But you should realize that there is this other process going on at the same time as the process you're interested in. Now we do VH scattering. Um, I sh time resolved polarization basically says I have a vector in the molecule and the vector changes direction. VH scattering does something else. Here is a chunk of a molecule. I send in a light wave. I'm sending in a light wave. The light wave acts on the molecule and the solvent around it. And the light wave creates, because I'm applying an electrical field, I polarize the molecule. I don't permanently polarize it. I give it an oscillating dipole that is oscillating at the frequency of visible light. That's a nice round number. Now I'm going to do this with polarized light. The light is polarized in the plane of the blackboard. So there's an electric field of the light pointing this way there is no electrical field pointing out of the board towards you. So the, the light comes in. The electrical field acts on the molecule. It tugs one way on the electrons, the opposite way on the nuclei. And because it does this, it creates a dipole moment in the molecule. It creates an oscillating dipole. And what do oscillating dipoles do? We have an electrical dipole that oscillates at some frequency. It emits electromagnetic radiation, here light, at the same frequency. Uh, the lowest frequency version of this, this was actually done as an experiment a century ago to test Maxwell's equations. If you take a static dipole moment, a bar that's charged plus at one end and minus at the other. And you spin it fast, it will emit radio waves at the spinning frequency because it's an oscillating dipole. It really works. But we don't have to do this, though. We just are sending in the visible light. And we create a dipole that is at some angle with respect to the plane of polarization. When the dipole emits, the dipole emits light that has this polarization. Not the, it's related to the polarization of the incident light, but it's not the same. In particular, the polarization of the scattered light is determined by the polarization of the incident light. And there will be a, an object that sits here a mathematical object, and changes the incident vector into the final vector. This object is a 3 by 3 matrix, or a tensor. 
and you do um, matrix multiplication, and the direction of the, the direction of the scattered light, the polarization, is determined by the orientation of this molecule. And it's determined by the fact that the molecule dipole is not just lined up with the um, dipole with the incident field. Now, there are ways of beating this. For example, if you have a perfect sphere, because of the symmetry of the sphere, if there's nothing inside the sphere to give it an orientation, if you didn't manufacture it, you could. You could manufacture it so all the molecules inside the sphere are lined up. Um, but if we didn't do anything like that, it's just a sphere, and the scattered light will have the same polarization as the incident light. Now what happens? Well, there's scattered light coming out toward you, and some of it has polarization perpendicular to the incident polarization. However, this molecule is moving. It's diffusing. It has, we have segmental or reorientation. And because this molecule is moving, the brightness of the scattered light keeps changing. Because this orientation keeps changing, and therefore the angle between this object, which is really a 3x3 three three matrix, and this incident light keeps changing, so the brightness of the emitted light, the depolarized brightness, changes. And it changes on the time scale on which this molecule reorients. So if I characterize the fluctuations, the changes up and down in the brightness of the scattered light, the depolarized light, I can characterize how long it takes this molecule to forget which way it was pointing. Now what sort of time scales are we talking about? Well, we are talking about the time scale on which molecular reorientation occurs. So there will be a piece that occurs very, very fast, like on picosecond time scale. But there will be another piece, the Stockmeyer type A. There will be a small piece that requires the whole molecule to change its direction, to reorient. And that can take place on time scales down to seconds even. This technique does not have any of the problems that NMR and time resolved polarization do with natural processes that keep you from seeing what's going on. This is, sta this is stable, this is stable, and even if the reorientation is very slow, you can track it just as straightforwardly as you could if it was fast. So the problem I mentioned with time resolved polarization where, yeah, you have a chromophore, the chromophore has a lifetime, and eventually that lifetime gives you a headache in trying to get the experiment to work. Here we don't have that problem at all. Okay. So I have now described methods for measuring orientation. And I have given you a very simplified description. I don't I think I have said anything that goes that was too oversimplified. Um, as I said, for next time, for this chapter six, read reference 14 and we will discuss it in class. Uh, and hopefully we will all be ready to talk about it without having to look at what was in it. Okay. So we are talking about reorientation, and the question is. What physical processes actually cause reorientation? What physical processes give us the relaxations that these methods um, claim to measure? Well, the simplest thing you could do is to say, yeah, I talked about Stockmeyer ABC. How do you know that I'm right? How do you know that that's a reasonable description? How do you know that it's local chain motions that are causing reorientation. And the simplest answer, and for NMR, this goes back to the review article of Heatley 
and there are corresponding measurements with other techniques, is that you measure the time required for the reorientation to occur. Now that's a typical time. It's not a, you wait exactly that time and things suddenly flip 90 degrees. It's a gradual process. And what you find is that this typical time is independent from the molecular weight of the polymer. That is, you make the polymer longer, you make the polymer shorter. We'll get to the within reason limitation on that. And nothing happens to the relaxation time. Well, that's very nice. Um, what does that tell us? It tells us that we're looking at some little piece of a polymer chain, physically, and the, poly the piece we're looking at doesn't care very much about what's out here. However, we know from a wide variety of techniques that if you have a whole chain and you ask how long does it take for the whole chain to reorient, the longer the chain is, the slower the head over heels motion is. And therefore, the statement that we are seeing a process that is more or less independent from the molecular weight of the polymer tells us that we're seeing a local, for the most part, a local chain motion. With VH scattering, you can do a bit better than that. And you can also look at processes on quite different time scales. And if you go down so that you're looking at chains that are less than two or 4,000 Daltons, you're looking at chains that are, if it's polystyrene, tens of subunits long, very short chains, then the reorientation time does depend on polymer molecular weight. And the reason for that is that if the chain is very short, the process by which it actually reorients, the whole chain reorients, con contributes significantly to how long it takes for this little piece to reorient. So that, therefore, if you look at very short chains, you actually can see a molecular weight dependence. Uh, the statement you can see a molecular weight dependence tells you something else. Here is a little piece of a polymer chain whose orientation you're measuring. Um, that ta orientation time, how long does it take for the molecule to change direction, is not the same as if you had a monomer floating free in the solution. It's not the same because the two ends are coupled to the stuff on each side. <coughs> to change this direction, you have to move the stuff on each side. And therefore, there is a coupling between the monomers and the stuff on each side. Well, this number tells you, roughly speaking, in some sense, how far out that coupling extends. If you go out further than this, the motions of this piece, the local motions, are independent of what's happening out here. But there's a distance within which the motion of this piece and the motions of the neighboring pieces are coupled to each other. It is as if you had a very long line of people, not a straight line, but a wiggling line, and they were all holding hands. Well, if I'm holding hands with two people, I can't do this very much. But if there are a group of us, we can move backwards and forwards. And if I'm in the right place, I can turn. And the question is, how far along the line is it before what we're doing and what the other people are doing doesn't care very much about each other? And it's some number like this. Um, that is not a very precise number for several reasons. Okay, let us push ahead and let us ask um, what sort of information we get out experimentally. Now, one of you was kind enough to remind me last time that if I'm not careful, I can download pages from the final manuscript which have different page numbers than the ones that are in the book. So I'm going to start stay with figure numbers, and we are going to push ahead to figure 6-1. 
and hmm? I have a question. Uh, you you're just talking about the linear polymer. If it has the tenon group, and the tenon group will be have some resistance to the motion. And uh, uh, the question was, if I have a star polymer, yes. yes. What what is what happens if I have a star polymer? group will have some resistance to the motion of the others. Okay, well, there can also be things with little pieces coming out of here, short groups. Uh, the answer is the t rotation time is determined by the molecular structure. And one of the things that happens if the polymer chain is thicker, pendant groups off to the side, it won't move as quickly. It also won't move as quickly because the side groups will get in each other's way. You can also have a polymer chain in which you have things coming off. These are what are called star polymers. And the fact that you have a star will have some effect on motion here. Out here, the fact that it's a star polymer won't matter nearly so much. Okay? All right, so we will chug ahead to figure 6-1. And figure 6-1 looks at relaxation time, and this is a um, time-resolved polarization, and you notice the time scales we're looking at are in nanoseconds, tens or hundreds. And these are results primarily of V of V and Tardivo. And there's a measurement of tau. And this is as a function of the concentration of polymer. These experiments actually go up to something like 0.5 gram polymer per gram system. That's about, most things are about the same density, and therefore an 0.5 corresponds to roughly 50% of the system being polymer molecule and 50% of the system being solvent. And what you observe if you look at the graph is that there is this region in which the relaxation time increases not very much, a factor of two, something like that. And when we get up to about 0.3 gram per gram, 300 gram per liter, and above that, the relaxation time increases very dramatically. You see what's happening. If you think about that, that's a curve we've seen before. Because if you look at the discussion of solvent motion in the previous chapter, this is a little piece of polymer reorienting, but if you look at the discussion of solvent motion, for solvent motion, we chug along until we get to about the same place, and then there's a quite dramatic change in how rapidly the solvent can move. And it can only move much more slowly in most systems. So what we say is we do this experiment, and gee, um, the constraints that interfere with solvent motion in concentrated solution are replicated if we ask how rapidly we can get a um, little piece of a polymer chain to reorient. Okay. Yes. Uh, we'll chug that because uh, it that caused by the entanglement between the molecules. Uh, the question is, what causes this physical effect? Well. The first point is, since it affects the solvent molecules as well as the polymer chains, we can't very well say it's entanglement because the solvent molecules do not entangle. Furthermore, um, the entanglement, if you believe in entanglements and you have entangle, entangled chains, the ch entanglements last a very long time relative to this. So the pol polymeric background perhaps can be approximated, the large-scale structure as being stationary. 
So you sort of have to ask, well, what happens at about this concentration? The following uh, calculation, which I will only hint at, gives you an estimate of something that happens. Here are polymer coils. I am looking at a cross section of the solution. So this is a polymer coil that I've sliced like a piece of sausage. It's really coming out of the board towards you. If we were in a melt like these, the chains are very close together, or near melt. Now I'm going to put in a solvent molecule, which I'm just drawing as a hexagon so you can see it has a shape and it's not a polymer coil. There is a typical distance psi between two polymer chains. Here psi is very tiny. It's not zero because there are packing constraints and this is a liquid, but here psi is somewhat larger. There is also a, a typical size R of a, polymer, of a solvent molecule. The argument I am giving is in fact based on a paper by Kai et al. This is not in my book because the paper was in macromolecules uh, this last fall, 2011, and they discuss this length. They don't quite get give the following argument, but they do give the length scale that lead to the argument. There is a concentration at which the typical spacing between polymer molecules gets small enough that solvents can't fit through the gap. And when this space gets small enough that the solvent molecules can't pass through the gap, suddenly the solvent molecules don't flow freely and all sorts of dynamics must change. Well, how big is this gap going to be if um, it's too small for motion? What sort of concentration do we get? I'm going to draw a sketch that approximately answers this question. Here is one of those polymer molecules. Here is the distance to the next chain out, which is psi. That's their notation. And here is a circle around the big chain. The polymer chain has some radius little r. This distance is half the size of a polymer molecule. And you should realize these are very approximate arguments. The cross-sectional area of the polymer coil is pi r squared. I hope I didn't surprise anyone. The cross-sectional area of this big thing is something like pi r plus, I'm sorry, little r, plus big R over 2 squared. The ratio of these two numbers, remember polymers are very, very long, almost infinitely long relative to this picture. This ratio is approximately the fraction of the volume of the solution that is filled with polymer. That is, this area times infinite length, is the volume of polymer in the picture. This is the volume of polymer plus its cut of the total volume of the solution. And so this ratio is very approximately phi, the volume fraction of polymer when you get this transition. Well, a typical polymer coil is somewhat bigger than a typical solvent molecule, though it obviously depends on which polymer and which solvent. But if you put in numbers like for this, you, if you put in reasonable numbers for little r and big r, you discover this number is, oh, sort of like, but less than a half. It's not a twentieth or a tenth, and it's not 90%. It's some number vaguely like that. And so this discontinuity, which is 
transition, whatever you choose to call it, which is actually seen in a variety of dynamic processes, corresponds approximately to the point at which solvent molecules can no longer squeeze between, flow freely between polymer chains, and also the space at which, if I have another polymer coil here trying to move like this, it runs into problems getting between its two neighbors because there's not consistently enough room. So that appears to be what it is. I do, um, we have now moved from the paper, which the book, which is giving a discussion, and I started writing in 2006, so 2006, 2011. We have now gotten to something which is a paper I've written, which is passing back and forth between me and the journal referee. So we are now as close to cutting edge research as you can get. But that appears to be a reasonable explanation. If you read through the book, since I hadn't seen that and haven't had the idea myself, I will refer to the transition of large amounts of evidence for it and say in the book that I don't know what it was. Well, that's changed. We've made progress. Okay, let us push ahead, and we will push ahead after figure 6.1 to work by Waldo and collaborators. And in most of these cases, I do not know these people, so I can infer some of them were faculty members and some of them were grad students, and I will simply refer about to papers by first author. And the issue is, suppose we look at the relaxation time versus the molecular weight. Qualitatively, what was found was that if we um, look at a relaxation time versus molecular weight for a polymer in a good solvent, there's not much of an effect. If we look at a relaxa same relaxation time in a theta solvent, the relaxation time increases somewhat as we increase the molecular weight. And I should emphasize this is a weak effect. It's much weaker than, say, the effect of solvent viscosity, but there is a modest effect. And one can then ask, well, that's very interesting. How can we possibly explain this? And what was done was to do a calculation. Here is a polymer chain. And we are going to change the solvent quality. Oh, I'm going to survey the class briefly. Hands if you've ever heard a discussion of solvent quality. Good solvent, theta yeah. solvent. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the question is, if we have a good solvent, the chains would rather interact as their neighbors with solvent than with um, other polymer. And the chain coil is expanded. If we're in a theta solvent, chain contracts. If we are in a poor solvent, there's catastrophic failure and eventually things fall out of solution. Or you get a protein molecule, the polymer folds up. A, a proteins, that is chains of amino acid, view water as a poor solvent. The proteins are happy to dissolve, but only after they've rolled up. The opposite of they do this is seen in egg white. If you have egg white and you heat it up, for example, because you've been cooking, the egg white is happy to denature. And if it denatures, because for example, you've put it in hot water, it sticks to all sorts of surfaces. You know, if you use soap, it sticks to all sorts of surfaces. And therefore, the cooking trick, which has been known for millennia, for reasons that people, though they didn't know why, is that if you were doing eggs, you want to wash the dishes in cold water first to get the egg white off, or it becomes much harder to wash. You see, polymer chemistry is actually good for something. Okay, in any event, what Waldo did was to say, I will look at a typical piece of polymer, not the center, but a typical chain section. And I will ask, 
how the density of chain segments near the chain segment I am looking at changes as I change the polymer molecular weight. This is not the same as saying I have a polymer chain, I will calculate the typical density of polymer chain segments at the center. Um, you may have seen the let's calculate at the center calculation. This is a different calculation. It's a much harder calculation. You could do it, for example, with computer simulations. And it gives a different answer. And the answer it gives is that if you have a polymer coil in a good um, solvent, the density of segments near this chain does not change as you change the polymer molecular weight. If you have a polymer coil in a theta solvent, and you ask how many other chain segments are near this one, as I increase the polymer molecular weight, the number of chain segments goes up. I should stress, this is the density of chain segments, for example, this one, or this one, that are close to a typical chain segment, not that are close to the middle of the chain. That's two different calculations, and you want to realize they're different and distinct. And so, this effect is explained as, well, you have chains that are trying to move, and if there are other nearby segments, they bump into each other, there are hydrodynamic interactions, they interfere with each other's motions. Okay. Professor? Yes? Um, can you then define in the near, what's the scale of the near? Um, you will have to consult the original papers. But we're talking a few monomer, if you, I said it was a few monomer diameters. It wouldn't be wildly different from that. Um, what may have been done is to um, calculate, say, the density at near contact. Um, but look at the original papers. Okay, so let us push ahead, and we will push ahead from figure 6.1, and we'll skip figure 6.2, and we will get eventually to figure 6.3 and 6.4. So we do an experiment and we take a um, polymer and um, we are going to take a polymer that has had anthracene stuck into its middle. So here is a polymer chain and here is a piece of anthracene and another chain. And the anthracene is arranged so that the transition dipole, if we do fluorescence of the anthracene, points exactly along the chain. So, rotation like this does nothing. Um, it's not a side group. Only Stockmeyer type A rotation motion can re re relax which way this thing is pointing. So we are in a series of different solvents. And then, saying we're in a solvent, if we change the temperature, we change the viscosity of the solvent. And so the simplest reaction is, okay, I change the reaction of the viscosity of the solvent, and we innocently, and not quite correctly, as you can see from the graph, say, this is a diffusion process. It will go inversely as the viscosity of the solvent. Well, that's a guess. So how can you change the viscosity of a solvent? Well, there are two things you can change. You can change the temperature, that's figure 6.3. And you can also go in and change the pressure. Because if you have a solvent and you run up the pressure, its ability to flow changes sometimes quite substantially. And you actually, if you're doing high pressure or flow design, you actually have to think about these things or there will, can be negative consequences. And we then ask, well, okay, we have done this. How does the reorientation time 
depend on temperature and pressure and viscosity? And the answer from a whole series of papers, and there are, I mentioned, um, I mentioned Adolf, and there are a whole series of papers uh, which vary different things, which are very clever papers. But if I said there's some tau zero, which is just a constant, and then there's viscosity to a power a, and then there's an exponential factor e to the a, some e plus p v a over, I'll write it, the gas constant as r, could also be written as k b. And there's what could be described, would in some circles be called an activation energy. E sub a and V sub a are constants that don't care which solvent you're in or which temperature you're in. And this is the temp, and there is, there, there is a background temperature and pressure dependence of how fast the polymer can move that does not care about the solvent at all and can be written in this form. And then hiding outside of this, there is a number that depends on the viscosity to some power. This is what is called a generalized Cromer's relation. Cromer's was a Dutch physicist for going back 60, close to 60 years at this point, who actually was talking about a completely different physical phenomenon. And what he said was that the rate at which the process can occur will be inverse into the viscosity of the solvent. Whatever, whatever process you were talking about, well, the rate at which something occurs being inverse to the viscosity, and the time it takes it to occur to be linear in the viscosity are the same thing. The Cromer's relation without generalized would have A equal 1. The generalized Cromer's relation has viscosity to some power. However, when we say we're changing the viscosity of the solvent, if we change the temperature and the pressure, we also change how much energy is available, for example, to rotate a chemical bond in the polymer around its axis. We, all, we change um, issues that are associated with the ability of the polymer to move in ways that have nothing to do with the solvent. So we do all that, and we get to figure 6.3. And what figure 6.3 shows is this reorientation time versus viscosity. And fortunately, the original authors took a huge number of measurements, so there are lots and lots of dots on that graph. And what you see is that there is a segment of the data where A is about 1, that is, the time increases roughly linearly in the viscosity. And in this system, at something like two centipoise, there is a crossover which is extremely sharp. And we have viscosity to the A power for A, as I recall, for that figure is 0.67. Now, we saw that figure when we talked about solvent viscosity 2. Namely, if you measure conductivity of, or diffusion of small molecules in a viscous solvent, you get a graph that looks almost exactly like 6.3. Yes, it happens different solvent. The crossover occurs at a different viscosity. But you have a low viscosity region where A is 1, a high viscosity region where A happens, and it's, in this case, it's 2 thirds. Uh, if you read the chapter, you'll discover there are other cases where the viscosity, where A is more like 0.5, depending on which physical technique you use to measure rotation. Oh, why should the um, A care about the physical technique? The answer is, if you're looking at this molecule 
at the center. This is anthracenes, fused benzene rings. It's a certain modest number of angstroms across. If you're looking at depolarized light scattering, you're looking at lumps that are oh, a persistence length long that are somewhat larger. If you did this with NMR, I can't show where NMR has been used to do this. Um, it may have been done. Uh, you're looking at single chemical bonds. Chemical bonds are small. And therefore, you look on different distance scales and the coupling of the motion to the viscosity of the solvent changes. As you make the object you're looking at bigger, the coupling becomes, to the viscosity becomes stronger. Okay. So that is a description of the generalized Cromer's relation. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I misremembered. There is NMR data, and it does show this. And the, it's for NMR data, A is more like a half up here. The NMR is looking at a single bond, which is very small in D. The coupling to the viscosity is weaker. The um, time-resolved polarization, here's an anthracene, it's bigger. A is larger. I'm sorry, I misremembered that. Uh, you could also, by the way, attach this group at the end rather than the center of a chain, you should not be surprised to learn that the relaxation times for an end group are, okay, let's guess, Is, are the relaxation times for the end group going to be smaller or larger than the relaxation times in the middle? Anyone want to guess? Well, it's in the book, and the answer, of course, is smaller, because if I'm out here at an end, I'm much freer to flop back and forth than if I'm in the middle. Um, so that's the answer to that. Um, the last thing we can do, there's another way to change the viscosity. We will change the viscosity not by changing the temperature, or changing the pressure, or changing which small molecule solvent we use. Instead, we will measure relax this relaxation time versus polymer concentration. And if you um, have some polymers, you see the effect we showed in figure 6.1, where there is a change at 400 gram per liter. However, if the polymer is bulky and the solvent molecule can move cleverly, um, what we we'll instead find for tau versus phi are what appear to be smooth curves. And the smooth curves are, in fact, stretched exponentials. OK, we are almost out of time. I have spent today discussing um, motion of g, little pieces of a chain segments. We will now advance tomorrow, well it's Wednesday really, we will advance to chapter 7 and we will discuss dielectric relaxation. Dielectric relaxation is an incredibly powerful tool for studying polymer dynamics. It has not been used nearly as much as it merits given how powerful the technique is. And dielectric relaxation gives you everything from motion of short segments up to motion of the whole chain, the size of the chain, internal modes. It does all sorts of things, as we will see starting next time. Please read chapter 7 before next time. We are done. Class dismissed.